We're out here at an actual installation of a TTP outdoor split unit heat pump, and we're going to go through the process of replacing a coaxial heat exchanger. So during the reclamation process of the refrigerant, which is step one on these projects, while we were doing the reclamation project, we have actually removed the access panels and one of the cross members here on the outdoor unit to give us good working access. You can access a lot of the work area within the unit once you remove the top and many of the outdoor components. So now that we have reclaimed all the refrigerant, We've actually hooked up a hose, and because this is an environmentally friendly ethanol antifreeze, we're gonna go ahead and isolate the ground loop, which we have, we have done by closing the two valves involved with isolating just the ground loop. This installation has a common ground loop with another TTP unit next door here. That one can continue to operate while we go through this simulation of replacing a coax because we can isolate just this coax and this unit. So we're gonna go ahead and take the pressure, the fluid pressure off this coax. Again, it doesn't take much fluid to go flat. Okay, so you've heard now that we've we released all the pressure. I'm gonna let that drain out for just a little bit. Our next step is going to be that we're going to come in here and we're going to start to bare our work area. Because this is a ground loop, closed loop application to keep it from sweating and, and having a lot of corrosion problems, everything internally is insulated. You have the clamshell insulation that covers the coaxial heat exchanger. We're going to remove all the, uh, the insulation around that. We're going to remove what's necessary for the Armaflex and foam tape in the area so that we don't you know start a lot of fires and doing a lot of, of, uh, of repair work down the road. We're going to go ahead and we're going to disconnect our reversing valve leads and we're going to get those wires out of the way so again we don't have any issues with the torch. I'm going to put it over here on the other side. We'll probably end up wrapping the uh, reversing valve area so we don't get excessive heat there. We're probably going to go ahead and remove the uh, PT ports, so again we don't overheat those as well. We're also going to end up wrapping our thermal expansion valve again to protect it from any overheat and, and causing more issues. Also in this process, which we'll get to because we're doing major surgery and opening up a refrigerant circuit, we will be replacing the sight glass and the biflow filter dryer. Again, guys, the things that you got away with with R22, you're not going to get away with with R410A good refrigeration practices is an absolute must. If you don't, it will bite you, it will haunt you. So let's go ahead and make our work area uninsulated. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the spine insulation. So we're going to be removing the final bit of insulation here off our FP1 sensor. Our thermistor, again you got to protect that. We're going to carefully cut the retaining straps. then remove the clip. And get it completely out of our way. Again, to be uh, certain that we're not going to overheat our PT ports and possibly damage those, we're gonna go ahead and remove those, both of them. Always use a backup wrench because it's been a brazed connection, which means it can be a little bit softer just making sure again we're not going to create more work than we absolutely have to accomplish here. And 
Okay, that's going to obviously allow us to further bleed down any of the uh, fluid that's still captive in the coaxial heat exchanger. Now we're getting close to being ready to go ahead and cut not only the refrigerant lines, but also the water lines going in and out of our coax. We're going to try and cut them to where it's going to be an easy area to work on and, and make our, our connections again. We're going to make sure that we're going to wrap our thermal expansion valve with a good wet rag. Sometimes people use a thermal paste, that's even better yet, to protect any heat from, from this area here. We'll probably go ahead and attempt to unbraze the refrigerant uh, connections here, and, un and most likely we're going to go ahead and cut the, uh, the, the water lines on the coax. Then we're going to reach back behind. There's a bracket on the very back of this. We'll show you once we remove it, but there's two bolts holding the coaxial to the floating vibration mount here. Again, to knock down and isolate any vibration. It's attached to the plate the same as the compressor is. So we'll remove those two bolts, disconnect the refrigerant lines, disconnect the water lines, then this coax assembly is ready to be removed. All right, we've gone ahead and wrapped a wet rag around our thermal expansion valve, again, protected from any heat uh, that might migrate up to it. I've also wrapped some wet rags around the insulation around our reversing valve. Again, I'm going to be doing some, some uh, heating around here with the torch. Want to minimize any damage we might cause and, and minimum fires, obviously, tough to avoid. Next, we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut our two water lines here. So let's go ahead and cut those loose. I'm cutting it as fairly close to the braze connection as I can so that I can go ahead and couple it. Now, because this is a, the water side, I can go ahead and soft solder this, 95.5 solder, or I can braze it. Either one is perfectly acceptable because we're not talking about the refrigerant pressure here, only water pressure only our closed loop fluid on this side. Again, we want to say, make sure that you're using good tubing cutters, not a hacksaw or sawzall. You really want to avoid putting any of those kind of metal shavings through the system. And I hope I don't have to mention that that's also a no-no on the refrigerant side. And we're using a close cutter down here on the bottom connection, which is able to clear the pan. Now I'm going to go ahead and burn off a little bit of the excess adhesive from the foam tape here and wipe it off so I don't contaminate our system. Anytime you're going to be operating on a refrigerant system, you're doing any brazing, you want to make sure that you're trickling dry nitrogen through the entire system constantly to again avoid any oxidation inside the pipe, which is going to plug up your metering device and potentially uh, cause you some issues. Now we're ready to remove the coax heat exchanger. Again, you can see the mounts that we had to disconnect that holds onto the uh, floating isolation plate there in the bottom of our unit. And now it's time to prepare the other coaxial heat exchanger. 
Okay, so what we've done now is we've actually taken some scratch bright or uh, emery cloth and we've cleaned up our original pipe as well as the copper stub coming out of the coax on both sides. We've put some 7 8 inch couplings in place here and we've dry fit this to make sure it's going to sit properly and appropriately. We had to actually adjust the piping angle just ever so slightly. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to soft solder this because again we don't have to braze this because it's not uh, going to experience refrigerant pressure. Prior to that though we're actually going to pick up the coax. We're going to put a piece of foam tape underneath on the bottom where it rests. Again, we want to protect and cover anything that's going to be uh, below an ambient air temperature because of the refrigeration cycle and, and causing some sweating and degradation over time. Okay, so we've completed our water connections to the coaxial heat exchanger. We've rebrazed our refrigerant tubing connections under a dry nitrogen environment. And because we opened up a refrigerant circuit with 410A and we implement nothing but good refrigeration practices, we have replaced the bifold filter dryer with the correct desiccant uh, filter dryer, as well as our outdoor split units come with a sight glass, so we've replaced the sight glass also under a dry nitrogen environment. We have then pressure tested over 100 PSI, again leak testing, uh, checking with the uh, dry nitrogen. We have, for the better part of an hour and a half now, pulled a uh, deep vacuum on our refrigerant circuit down to about 250 microns. And so now we are ready to go ahead and weigh in our charge. Now, because we had to recover all the refrigerant out of the system, we're going to weigh in the factory charge out that was originally in the outdoor split unit and then correct for any line set that we may have. So in this instance, we're gonna have to weigh in a total of uh, uh, six pounds, as it turns out. One of the critical components when you're doing open surgery on a refrigerant system is you want to make sure that you're using a good digital vacuum gauge to make sure that you're pulling down to a true deep micron vacuum. It's critical with 410A systems and the PoE oils. Don't just rely on your manifold gauges. Remember, they're not all that accurate unless you're, you are frequently calibrating your your, your manifolds. We're now ready to go in and weigh in our charge. We've uh, connected up our bottle of 410A refrigerant. We've zeroed out our electronic scale. We've already burped the uh, uh, air out of the uh, line coming from our refrigerant tank. So now we're going to go ahead and start to weigh in the total of, in this case, six pounds. It's actually uh, five pounds, 15 ounces, but you want to add a little bit for your, uh, your, your refrigerant hoses in most cases. So we're going to go ahead and start to weigh in a total of six pounds. Again, anytime you're charging a 410A refrigerant system, you want to make sure you only charge liquid into the system using a good digital scale. So next I'm going to take you around and I'm going to show you some of the things we need to do to finish up over where we've been doing the, the work on replacing the coaxial heat exchanger. We're ready to re-insulate and reconnect the sensor as well as the leads that go to the reversing valve.